them. So first off, thanks for, for everybody that, that's showing up this evening. I think we're very, very excited about this session. Uh, it's our, our inaugural session for the three that we have with, uh, with Tech Life Live Series. So um, couldn't be more excited about getting uh, Ben Kelly in here with us to talk talk all things space and, and that kind of stuff. So kind of as a obligatory, I kind of introduced myself first off, my name is DJ Dougherty. I'm the CTO of August 20. And we're a fairly new software consulting company and, and kind of focused in there or, or based in Columbus, Ohio, but we're working all over. Um, our kind of our, our, our mission is that we really focus on what the, what the client's looking for, what, what are their greatest challenges and building solutions that, you know, with speed and precision and we have, ex we have experience of pretty much across the, the gamut, but you know, precision agriculture, automotive, both just on, on the vehicle and, uh, and autonomous, recreational vehicles, medical devices, radar, uh, autonomous uh, systems in general. And we really like to kind of say we're mobile to metal. So we can, we've got experience on you know, everything from mobile development clear down to the metal. So real quick, I wanted to introduce the name of our session. Uh, we actually, I'm kind of playing on this idea of the word dramalog. So dramalog is an emotional and rapid retelling of events in an overly detailed and dramatic fashion. So if you've, if anybody has met me before or met Ben, uh, the detailed and dramatic fashion won't be a problem and probably emotional and rapid won't be a challenge either. So, and then I'm playing on the idea that I'm changing this, the, the pronunciation of that. So everybody, you probably can't see, I've got this little uh, I, I sent off a bottle of whiskey to Ben, so uh, please join us in your favorite beverage, whether it's adult beverage or not. And so we're tonight going to be uh, talking through a session called Dramalog. So let's get let's get right to it. So Ben Kelly, uh, I, I'm super, super lucky. I uh, got to meet Ben several years ago. I consider him a friend. I consider him a whiskey drinker. Um, super, super all around smart guy. Um, he's the founder and CEO of the launch company. Uh, the launch company is based out of Alaska. I'll let him give more details on this, but they're building the first multi-user launch site for this planet and beyond. Um, so Ben will thank me. I think I stole that right off his website. So if he didn't want me to say it. He shouldn't have put it out there. But uh, sure. anyway, I thought the easiest thing to do would be just to kind of open this up and let Ben kind of just start telling us a story. How did you get started? How did you, you know, how did this career become what it became? Cool. Okay. Thanks, DJ. I appreciate it. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And thanks for the whiskey in the mail. That was a that was a great treat to open. And it was like five degrees that day, so it was it was nice and chilled and ready to go. Perfect. Yeah, that's awesome. So, um, yeah, the the launch company. We like to say, I like your mobile to metal thing. It's similar. We say from the sketch pad to the launch pad. So we work with space companies from the conception of an idea of wanting to go to space all the way up to. Um, companies that regularly go, um, helping them streamline operations, operational processes. Um, we work on um, thermofluidic design, structural design. And what we've done over the years is kind of changed, you know, what we call, and I think everybody's familiar with like turning the crank consulting into, you know, spinning off products. So we have um, a number of products that we've spun off that um, are doing, doing well. One set of them is like fueling fittings for spacecraft. Um, you know, fueling interfaces for rockets um, that, you know, have flown, have flown to space. I like to say we're the only orbital space company in Alaska. Um, we certainly don't want to be the last, but we're the only ones here right now. Um, and one thing that's been really cool is Alaska's got a commercial spaceport on Kodiak Island that has been getting more busy. So, you know, I started this business in Alaska because I think this is a great place to live. It's where I wanted to raise, raise the family and, um, you know, grow old and enjoy life. And, then the Kodiak Space Force started getting busier and all of a sudden it just also looked like a savvy business move. It looked like we were playing three years ahead of the, you know, skating to where the puck was going to be, but it's just been good to see that get busier. Um, my background is I was at SpaceX um, in many forms for, for quite a few years. I um, came fresh out of grad school and was a, what's called a responsible engineer on Slick 4 East at Vandenberg. So that was, that's their West Coast pad. Um, if you're wondering what a responsible engineer is, you get sat down in a room and they're like, you are responsible. And that's kind of just the talk. And there's oh. like, are there any questions? And it's like, uh, yeah, you know, like what if this happens, you're responsible. You know, if, if a meteor comes from space, you're responsible. Like you've got to figure it out. And so I had a few fluid systems, um, actually the, the, not to put them on the spot, but 
kind of the the guru CAD master for for all the SpaceX launches is actually on this call. Um, Paul Asman, he's a good friend, and we're working with him on some other projects now at at Virgin Orbit. And um, you know, we had this giant NX model that we had to manage, and we built all these systems up, and then we went outside and and made it come to life. And it was it was a cool team, and it was a ton of fun. And um, I worked my way up to being a lead field engineer for that launch, and and that meant you know rolling the rocket out, writing procedures, getting things good to go. So they're all those are all things that kind of taught us what what we know now. Um, and so um, you know, as we're after that, I did I did the SpaceX barge. So was the lead field engineer for putting together just read the instructions. Of course, I still love you. Um, and um, those are the, were the East and West Coast barges. They're both over on the East at the moment. And um, man, went out to sea and and dropped some rockets on them and exploded them and brought, brought them back and tried to rebuild them and um, exploded them again. But yeah, ended up, you know, the team got it figured out and it was, it was a ton of fun. So yeah, now we've got um, t- close to 20 people um and growing fast we're um like i said we're building a lot of hardware i'm in a i'm not actually on the moon uh believe it or not i we're i'm in a our warehouse here which we got right at the start of covid which is just brilliant um we signed a big lease and then you know had to leave immediately and and go from home but we're we're coming back in now and we're building hardware for the air force um, for different private space companies um and uh really doing work all over the u.s so yeah we're having a ton of fun and it's, it's really been a great adventure. Wow. That's amazing. So you kind of slipped past, uh, your, you kind of, kind of introduced it, but you never got there. At least for me was you said you came and you, you know, graduated from grad school, but you didn't tell us where uh, oh. a lot of people on this call would be interested in that. Yeah. I went to the Ohio state university. <laughs> there yep. we go. Which is how I got mixed in with all y'all. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Maybe it may have been th- a good thing or a bad thing, but that's how we all got connected. So, <laughs> exactly. so along those lines, um, so I'm going to, I'm going to kind of back up a little bit before we get to the launch company, kind of talk a little bit about how you kind of got where you're at today. So I had made a note to myself that, you know, I did a little research and there's not a lot of programs out there, at least ones that I can find that say, Hey, I want to go to college and I want a program where I want to be a badass rocket builder, or I want to build a friggin' barge and land a, land a rocket on it. So those just don't exist. So how did you kind of, how did you get there? How did you, I know your, your background is in mechanical engineering. So how do you, like, how do you tell somebody to go through that? Or how do you tell them to become space? You know, whatever, whatever you want to think of from that question. Yeah, that's a, that's a super good question. And I, I do get asked that a lot. I mean, I, I'm from a very small town in Alaska. There was 50 people in my high school graduating class. I did my undergrad at University of Alaska Fairbanks. Um, I think, you know, if, if you're in school, there's always ways to get involved with, and it's always got to be through extracurriculars and, and club stuff. So we have a space grant um, university and we have a space grant program. So UAF actually has, I think, the, the world's only university owned and operated um, rocket range. And it's like a suborbital range. And we built a suborbital rocket to study actually what's behind you, the D region of the ionosphere, um, Aurora Borealis. And then we also flew on the Vomit Comet with NASA testing and satellite design. And so I was just kind of like hooked. I got these early experiences, but to be honest, I didn't know how to get into the industry. And um, I mean, I think probably in order, you know, privilege, luck, and then an insane amount of hard work is, is what it took. But I think, you know, if, if you're looking at it, something I tell people all the time is like rocket landing person wasn't, you know, a job description. Even when I started at SpaceX, we weren't doing it. And the key was, you know, getting as many experiences as you can, but, but I think it's the same with developers, like build your toolbox, like work in as many different environments as you can, get as much different broad expertise as you can. Um, I grew up as a bush pilot in Alaska. And so it ended up when I was getting hired into SpaceX, you know, I think there's a, like 100,000 new mechanical engineers graduating every year. And so all of them know, all of them know CAD. We all took the same thermal fluids classes. We all, you know, have the electrical class. And so it's like, what are you doing to stand out? And so for me, it was just, I just love working on, on sticky problems. And so it was trying to figure out, you know, how can I keep building interesting things? And I didn't really necessarily care about the industry. And what was cool about SpaceX was, you know, they, they needed that. And I think they still do, but really at the time they needed a bad, they had got a lot of really brilliant people there, but they're also looking for somebody that's going to roll up their sleeves, jump into the mix and actually go outside and help things get built. Um, and so that's what I was good for. You know, I, I, can, I can do the math, I can do all the work, but then I, I love being actually outside on the operations, working with the technicians, getting things built. And, and that's kind of the niche I carved out. And so 
I think, you know, if you're, if you're a young person looking to get in the industry, there's, there's always student clubs. Um, the amount of jobs out there right now is insane. I mean, everybody's hiring. Um, and so the way to stand out is to get as much early experience as you can and just know it doesn't have to be space experience. I designed a wind turbine in undergrad that we like, we, we designed it and we built it. And then we taught people how to make it out of like parts you'd find in a junkyard. And that was the project I pitched to SpaceX during my interview. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't like, oh, here's this rocket engine I designed, or here's this other thing. It's like, we built this thing like, wow, that's actually really interesting. And just nerded out about it for an hour and a half and then got a job offer. So it was cool. That's awesome. Yeah. I had a funny story kind of similar when I had, I had to pitch a, to a client kind of going along your lines there. I had to pitch to a potential employer how to, how to teach them how to do something. And of course, everybody comes to the table, you know, how to compile software or how to build this, you know, web page or whatever. And I taught them how to cast a fly rod. Oh, that's dope. It was like completely blew their mind because one, they were completely out of their realm. And so it let us, let us have a conversation versus them trying to critique me on every little thing that they already knew about. So yeah, you know, kind of cool. interesting there, how you, how you did that same thing. So, um, so along those lines you and if you'll notice i keep pulling things off the wall i've got all these questions i'm kind of like putting them in order in the right orders because i have no idea what order you're going to talk on things so sure. but we talked before so you mentioned that you know when you when you went to kind of join spacex you were right out of college you had no idea how to build a barge you had no idea how to land a rocket but you had all of this experience as a mechanical engineer, you knew, you knew the physics, you knew the math, you knew, you knew how, you know, I think a lot of it is growing up kind of in an environment where you had to, I don't want to say hack things together, but you had to learn how to build things out of things that maybe not necessarily be used that way. But you, in previous conversations, you and I talked about people, parts, and paper. Yeah. And basically you were refer referencing kind of the operations side of how do you, how do you manage a launch or a landing site? And so basically my question is, you've went off and built this company. So how do you balance this wild uh, need to be an engineer and this, this role of being CEO of a company? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. I think the, the, the thing that I learned coming through it in, and I love that you mentioned people, parts, and paper, that that used to be, that was just kind of like a grounding mantra we used to say as things were on fire and we're in trouble. It's like, hey, look, what do you need to actually solve this? You need, you need paper for a plan. You need parts to actually put together and then you need the people that are going to do it. If you have those three things, you're going to figure it out. And that was a great way to break it down into, you know, almost like when you listen to a word problem as a kid, they're like, a train departs from here at this time and departs from here at this time, you know, and there's all this extraneous detail that doesn't matter. Those things kind of bring you back to what matters and like, hey, we got to stay focused. This is what we're doing. I think for me, like, I love, I love technical problems. I love, um, I love building. When I think about this company, it's, it's the same thing. You know, we're still building. Um, for me, my, my interests have really evolved. And I think, you know, you, you likely feel the same way with what you're building. It's like its own huge technical problem. And then there's this amazing added element of like the human condition <laughs> on top of it, right? Where I think a lot of engineers maybe get frustrated with, but, but I actually really enjoy, you know, like how are we gonna get everybody aligned on board and, and actually building this really, really cool thing. And um, I just kind of switched to thinking about the company as a system of, of people who are, you know, working together towards a common goal. And it's really that simple. And so it's like, my job is to, you know, keep everything moving, keep everybody happy, keep everybody aligned. and that becomes its own huge technical problem that every day there's some new fire, there's some new challenge. You know, you might be helping pick somebody up, you know, after a really tough, you know, presentation, you might be like, you know, helping solve a technical issue at the last minute. And it's that variety, I think that like, keeps me very interested. And, and also, the, you know, the results, like seeing things actually ship, hiring young Alaskans and training them in this new field and, and watching them grow and take things on is, is crazy. We had this, this guy we hired as an intern and he ended up running a very significant project for us um, because he just wanted more. He's just like, give me more, give me more, give me more. And he ended up um, as part of the DARPA launch challenge, which we were like the subject matter experts for. Yeah. He's like, out, he ended up out on the pad with me, you know, during this, during this thing and, um, and was still in college, you know, it was just me and him out there running it. And I think that is like one of the coolest feelings where you're helping people, kind of experience the things you experience where you're like is this real life like we're on an island in Kodiak it's February 
you know, we're, we're trying to like get this figured out. And, you know, he has a test the next day type thing. And I was like, I'll call your professor. I'm pretty sure we can, we can get you a note for this one. You know, it's just really fun. And so that's the way I think about it uh, for sure. That's, yeah. That's amazing. I, I think I love, I personally love stories like that. I mean, you always love to hear the, you know, the opportunities that people get that you would never kind of expect. So yeah, let's talk kind of, I think people, at least I know over the, over the years of talking to you, um, I always love to hear about like, you know, how do you, how do you launch a, like a, a rocket? How do you land a rocket? You know, what is kind of that process? I mean, we don't, it's not every day that we get to walk out in our yard and all of a sudden there's a, you know, a Falcon nine sitting there. So, you know, what are, I guess, what are the things that you would kind of like walk us through that a little bit? Yeah, for sure. I mean, our, I always kind of joke, like our company exists because not too many people have a super strong <laughs> grasp on it. Um, and that grasp, you know, that, that process is changing all the time. I mean, the FAA put out new rules for launch and, and reentry, um, part 450 stuff that's really going to evolve and change things. And so it's changing all the time. Um, and there's a, there's a, we had a conversation with a CEO a couple of years ago who um, essentially was like, so what's it going to take? Like, we're going to build this rocket, you know, what's it going to take to launch it? Like, just like one or two people part-time. And I was just like, no, are you serious? You know? And like, he runs the company, right. They had raised a lot of money. And, and so it was just really funny. It just, there's, there's not a lot of understanding around it. Um, the, it, it takes a lot, you know, traditionally a rocket gets designed and built kind of in a vacuum, you know, it, prop engineers and, and vehicle engineers are making decisions that eventually will flow down to launch and create, you know, kind of a, a huge challenge operationally on the pad. So take like rockets need helium. People will be like, well, we want to save weight on the rocket. So we're going to make it a, a quarter inch line. And it's like, you get out to the pad and then it takes three hours to load helium if you're lucky. And they're like, well, this is unacceptable. It's like, well, you put a drinking straw on it, you know, but nobody's thinking about it, right? And so we try to come in early and, and, and help as early as we can. So it's like, hey, if you make this bigger, it's a little bit of a mass hit, but it's gonna improve your performance and just doing those trades, right? And um, then, you know, if you're really thinking about like, what does it take? You need, you need a launch site. There's only so many on-ramps to space in the world, let alone the US. Um, we're trying to work towards standardizing those so that there's always equipment, same as an airport, you know, um, there's always equipment ready to fuel the plane for takeoff. So we're trying to build standardization for different spaceports so that rockets are um, compatible across, you know, any pad that they would want to go to. And this is mostly for small and medium rockets, you know, big, big rockets like Falcon 9 and which is technically a medium rocket and, and really big rockets like what they're building for Super Heavy and Blue Origin's new Glenn will kind of continue to do their own thing. But we're trying to revolutionize the industry for the small and medium vehicles where we think we can build a lot of standardization. You got to get an FAA launch license, which can take six months if you're lucky. Um, you've got to do environmental analysis and then you have to build all the equipment, all the fueling equipment that goes out there. And it takes a lot of time. If you're launching off a US Air Force installation, you also have to get <laughs> approval from the Air Force. And they don't see your rocket as a rocket, they see it as a ICBM. And so now you're going through that whole process of, of tracking and where it's gonna go. Um, and kind of a funny story, you know, not, not to put anybody on the spot, but when we're doing the DARPA launch challenge, I was looking at nine spaceports around the U.S. and I was looking at them from, you know, top down, what would it take to launch a handful of different rockets out of them and, and creating these reports and plans and logistics. And we went to an Air Force base and said, hey, we want to launch a rocket 12 months from today. What do we got to do? And we're in this room with a bunch of like really grumpy looking old dudes and they're all like lined up around the room in these chairs, like around the perimeter room. And then there's a table in the middle of the room and there's another 10 grumpy, like the extra grumpy ones got to sit at the table and they're, they're all at the table and they're like, dude, it's not gonna happen. It's gonna take 18 months from today just to do program introduction, the PI paperwork, getting to know you, what your program's about, what you're building. And it's like, shoot, right? And so it's, it's having to change a lot because companies, you know, if you're on an 18 month VC cycle, you're, you don't, you can't make that time frame. So, you know, we ended up going out of Kodiak because you go and sit down with them. It's two people in the room and you say, Hey, I want to launch on this date. And they bring up the calendar and they go, yeah, that date's open. You go, great. What's your checklist? They send you a checklist and you go down all the ground safety plan, all the paperwork. It's a lot more streamlined on the commercial side. So there's a ton to know, to be honest, I, I could talk about it forever, but it's really changing a lot. And what we want to do is kind of be the grease. We want to build a lot of process and a lot of operational expertise that makes it easy for the next hundred rockets to, to get to orbit. Wow. 
Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, I'm gonna take, take a 10 second break. I forgot to mention this at the beginning. So we're gonna kind of let Ben go, kind of just let him let him go free form until about 20 minutes till the, till the hour. And then you guys send your questions in the chat and then we'll collect all of those and we'll get to as many of them as we can in the last 20 minutes. So um, we, we'll, see, we'll see how that goes and how it plays out. And, and uh, of course we'll retro at the end and see if we could change that for next time. But that's the plan we're gonna go with for now. So, so I think we've talked a little bit about uh, or not a little bit, quite a bit about your SpaceX experience, how you kind of went to college, got out of college, got into SpaceX and kind of got where you were going. So now I think the next the next step is, and probably there's lots of steps in the middle, but la the launch company. Yeah. You know, how did that come into existence? What, why did you do that? Uh, what made you crazy enough to think you could do it? Obviously you're doing it now, so maybe it wasn't so crazy, but at the time it might have thought, you know, you might have thought that, so. Yeah, I mean, I'll be... 100% honest with you, as I as I always am. I mean, it was it was a pure survival <laughs> necessity play. I had I had been I had um, I had quit SpaceX a, a handful of times <laughs> and kept being lured back in different forms, contractor, consultant, helping on different projects. And I loved the work. And I had to just be honest with myself. It's like, man, I really enjoy this. But you know, the the culture overall was not something that I felt was long term tenable for me, of just the way the way things were going. And so. I, I quit and moved to Alaska and actually started a different company um, called K2 Dronautics with my brother. And we were flying drones off the grid around Alaska. So we'd, we'd fly out in bush planes and then we'd deploy drones over like super remote regions and, and you know, track climate change and make maps and do like, it was really fun. I think we flew one of the first commercially available LIDAR units around the state. It was really, really cool. And so um, the, the thing was, is like, you know, I think a lot of people do this, like, we've got a great idea. And we jumped in and started this company and then I mean, it was just a battle, you know, it's bootstrap trying to build expertise and um, get clients and, and all of that. And so what happened was every now and then my phone would ring and it would be some rocket company be like, Hey, can you take a look at this? I'm like, yeah, sure. Take a look at it. And that kept building. And pretty soon I'm like, holy smokes, like we've got like three or four clients calling a drone company in Alaska. Like if that isn't a sign of pent up demand and need, like, I don't know what is. And so it was only two years ago, really, that I pivoted over to the launch company. And the impetus was I got into this like mentorship program in Canada, of all places, called Creative Destruction Lab. And our lead mentor was Chris Hadfield, this guy that sang the Bowie song on the International Space Station with a guitar, and just like a really cool guy. And that was the, I realized that was the first person I had talked to about this that was like a stranger, <laughs> you know, like not my friend from one of these companies. And I pitched him on the whole idea and I explained what we were doing and he was super supportive. And I started to kind of be like, huh, you know, he didn't like laugh us out of the room. Okay, maybe this is something. And it gave me that confidence to, to want to try. And um, to be honest, like I loved living in Alaska. I had a, a very new daughter and I was like, holy smokes, like we got to eat. So let's, let's shake the money tree and see what we can have come out. And I just started calling people and being like, hey, I'm calling it the launch company. This is the work I want to do. This is, here's, I sent my personal resume. You know, I was just like, here are the things I've worked on. Um, I would love to do this with you. And, and it slowly built over, over two years from one of us to now 20. And, and we're fully bootstrapped, just running, running on revenue, um, including like bootstrapping hardware programs, you know, like uh, actually building physical bits and bobs that go on spacecraft, go on rockets. We're building, you know, I'm pointing towards the side of the warehouse. We're building these 40 foot, um, fueling modules for the air force in here, you know, and it's just crazy how, how it's grown. We've just bit by bit pulled ourselves up and there was no magic other than an insane amount of, again, privilege, luck, and just persistence. I mean, dogged persistence. Cause I didn't have a backup plan. You know, there was not a, there was not something else that I can, could switch to up here. Right. Right. Yeah. You keep, which is working out well, you keep stealing my next question. So oh, sorry. no, that's perfect. It just gives me a good segue onto the next one. So, so when we talked a few, a few uh, it's probably been a few days ago, we were kind of going through this to kind of, kind of prepare what kind of questions you, you kind of wanted to make sure we covered. And one of them was, you know, describe how this bootstrapping hardware to space kind of like, what is that? Like, what is it? We don't understand the terms, I guess, you know, when it comes to those could that kind of you know question or whatever yes yeah, cool so like um space companies generally what you do there's there's a couple routes the main thing you do is you go and raise a ton of money from vc and you on the promise of, of what 
you're going to create and what you're going to build. A middle ground is to get, say, a NASA Small Business Innovation Research SBIR grant award and, and try to build from there and then get other customers. But what, what we did was, I mean, I'm not going to try to dress it up as, as anything other than insanity. Um, we, we just built, we just sold product. So we designed the product using our own money um, and said, this is what we're going to sell. Like we, we consulted enough that we had some money in the bank and we built these products and we sold them. And, and, and lo and behold, people loved them. And the way we, we found that opportunity was through the consulting, you know, I always joke that like, you know, being this insane, you know, I'm like, oh man, I'm such a genius. Uh, my client came to me and said, I need this thing. And I said, could I build it for you? And he said, okay. Right. Like we, we have not done anything, you know, outside the realm of, of just asking a lot of questions and, and um, figuring out what a common problem is for people and then using our money to build it. And it's, it's crazy stressful because if it doesn't work, <laughs> the company's just done, you know, right. like it's just, it's right. just game over flip. Right. So um, that it's been really, really cool though. And we've had some really stressful periods where, you know, you're, you know, you're working on this, this thing that has to work with cryogenic. So like negative 300 degrees, um, 6,000 PSI and it's helium, which is like one of the second to smallest molecules. So, and they're like, it can't leak. And you're like, okay, so it's going through wild temperature string swings. It's insanely high pressure and it's a tiny molecule. And just recently we got feedback from a client and they were like, we tried to build one of these on our own and yours has been on the test stand, like functioning on the rocket for the last, you know, six months and hit with hammers and moved all around blah, 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 and it still works better than what we can build. And so it's like incredibly gratifying on the backside of like, yeah. we built something really, really good, but man, it's just like, it's really hard, you know? And, and there was no, you know, we went to the, I'll tell you this real quick. We went to the bank and we were trying to finance a project. We're trying to finance this Air Force project. And I sit down and I got my lead hardware engineer with me and they look at him and they look at me and it's like, okay, two kind of like chubby guys in their thirties. And they're like, you guys starting a brewery? And we're like, no, no, not starting a brewery. And they're like coffee shop. And I was like, huh, -uh, no, we build rocket parts. And they just got this like glaze over their eyes. And they're just like, oh, okay. You know, like how, we should have screening for this. How did you get in here? And I showed them our website. I brought the product and explained it to them. I showed them a contract and still it was like pulling teeth. And so it's been, it's been an insane challenge, but it's, it's really been great too. I mean, it's yeah. every time I feel bad about it or I start getting down from the stress, I'm like, dude, this is exactly what I wanted. Right. Like we're having, it's a grand adventure. We're having a ton of fun. You're talking about building things. So earlier you alluded to these, these uh, shipping containers, but I know you also, you kind of found a need I was going to joke around the fact you should have told the bank. So I know you built these quick, quick disconnects. I want you to talk about those a little bit, sure. but that's what you should have told them. The banker was you're building these quick disconnects for a brewery. <laughs> yeah, probably, exactly. probably would have been all right. So, yeah, exactly. I mean, there's so many breweries in Alaska. I think they would have been like, Oh man, you got a huge customer base. This is great. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah talk, oh. talk a little bit about the stuff that, I mean, I know you, you don't just build landing sites or you don't just consult on how to get a, get, get a rocket off the ground or back onto the ground. Yeah. You also have kind of in the middle of Alaska built this very technical company, but then you've also seen the need, you know, you, you've seen these things that you can build that kind of can, I guess, subsidize your, your company as you go along when you kind of get a lull in the consulting piece of it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's been, it's, it's been a kind of like leapfrog. So like, we'll, we consider kind of two sides of the business, like the consulting services and then the hardware. And so it's almost been like a leapfrog where consulting will feed hardware, but then hardware is scalable. And yeah. so once we have the design, the, you know, the non recoupable engineering into that, we can scale that side and sell a bunch of them. And then it's like, Oh, cool. Now hardware is, you know, paying for services and then services, we start to productize, you know, um, we won in AFWorks, which is like innovation on the air force. I think it was 809 companies that applied and we were one of eight to receive prototype funding, which is really cool, um, to build mobile fueling modules. And so we're going to build a miniature version of our multi-user launch site and, ex and show how with process technology, we can give gas and commodities and fuel, move it all at different rates to meet different rockets needs all from one set of fueling modules. And we're going to go set it up in the backwoods of Alaska and like fuel a rocket and it's, and just to like make a point, right? But none of that's possible without funding from, from the other side. And so we continue just to reinvest 
a ton of time, a ton of cash into kind of building it along our roadmap towards the final goal. Right. Yeah. So I'm going to kind of lead the question a little bit. So one of the okay. things that I, in the conversations that we've had, one of the things that I really am kind of interested in and um, I'm really, guys, I guess, admire the way your company thinks is we talked about the, the shipping containers. Yeah. I think you had a lot of conversation previously about the reason you chose the shipping containers is because if you, if you take like a giant tank and write rocket fuel on it and try to ship it from Alaska to Florida, they, they get really, really stressed out. But if you put it inside of a shipping container, you know, you still have to label it, but it's, it's a common look. Everybody kind of, you know, just glazes over because it's, oh, it's a shipping container. Plus they're all similarly sized. They're easy to ship. Everybody knows how to ship a shipping container. So kind of like talk through that, like why you do those things and, and kind of like why it makes your business different because of that. Yeah, cool. So yeah, like fuels and stuff, we move in what are called like ISO containers. So they're all well labeled, they're framed, and then we give an MSDS. So that's that's one thing. But within the shipping container itself, if you open it, it's like it's like you know the electrical engineering equivalent is like if you open a box and it's just full of wires and glowing lights. People are like, what in the hell is this, right? You know, you don't yeah. want that question. So when you open one of our shipping containers, it's it's tanks and tubing and pumps and valves and it just looks crazy. I mean, of course, it's completely inert when we ship it. There's nothing inside. It's just metal tubing. But what's great about the shipping containers is you can, you can, you know, you can get them anywhere in the country. The logistics are solved. We've run into this so many times helping rocket companies with logistics where they're like, oh, well, we built this cool thing and it's fully custom. And then in the, you know, you talk to the shipping company and they're like, if it's going to go on a barge to go out to an island or, or to move somewhere, they're like, well, is it row, row or low, low? And then they just stare at you, right? Which is, is it roll on, roll off, or lift on, lift off? Yeah. And then they're like, oh, I guess it's low, low. And it's like, great. Is it break bulk or, you know, and so you go through all of these different things where the price just keeps going up to ship a random thing. If you just put it in a shipping container and you tell them what's inside of it on the, on the bill of lading, then all of a sudden, all the world's logistical systems, you know, bow at your feet because like, oh, we can deal with this. 10 foot, 20 foot, 40 foot, it goes where it needs to go. And it's also good from a, um, a sensitivity point of view. You know, we don't want to like write on the side, like sensitive rocket parts inside, you know, and people are like, oh yeah, it's sitting in a rail yard and they break in and, and to have a look, you know, it's just a beige box moving around the country. Um, what's cool about it for us is that they're also modular. So once we have a design, if a company wants to launch somewhere else or they want to launch a bigger rocket, we can just multiply those, right? So it's like, okay, we need twice as much fuel, throw another one out there and you're good to go. Um, so it's really been good for us. And, you know, a lot of companies have worked with it, but we, we did it on the barge and it was simply because when the barge would blow up, we could call back to the people on shore and be like, Hey, start building new shipping containers right now. And they could just replicate an order of parts, ship it all in and build the shipping container on the ground. And then once we got the deck fixed and all steel welded in, we just swung them up and, and we were good to go. So that, that modular thing, you know, seeing that modular approach in practice was really, really cool. Yeah. Very cool. So we're, we're really quickly coming up on 20 minutes before the hour. So I've got one more question for you and then we'll, I, I'll start reading through the questions in the chat and we'll start collecting those. Um, yep. So I know you're excited about this one. I think you want to, I want to give you a little bit of time to talk about it. So okay. when I say Voyager space holdings, that obviously means a lot to you. So I'm just going to kind of leave it at that, let you talk for a few minutes, and then I'll kind of collect some questions together, and we'll we'll finish this out with with uh, questions from the from the crowd. Okay, cool. Thanks, DJ. Yeah. So um, we are about ten days out from getting acquired um, by a company called Voyager Space Holdings, which is freaking awesome, super exciting. It's essentially going to you know exponentially increase the rate at which we can march towards our vision of you know, building, building pads, building hardware, um, and creating launch services for people. And the amount of connections we're getting is crazy. I was on a business trip just last week where they want to, you know, turn this island into a spaceport and have us help build everything out there and operate the spaceport on this remote island. And it's like, holy smokes, this is really cool. And so it's essentially supercharging our team, supercharging our ability to grow. Um, first thing we're doing is bringing all our manufacturing in house, um, you know, and setting up a, a full machine shop and, it's really, really cool um, what we'll be able to march towards. And the other thing that it does is lets us expand into on space. So the big thing right now is on orbit refueling, on orbit servicing of different satellites, trying to extend the life of these spacecraft. 
And it just so happens the quick disconnects we build are great for that. So we are, have already been chosen for a couple of really cool projects to build, um, you know, hardware onto these, these uh, spacecraft they are going to go to other heavenly bodies. They're going to be working in orbit and it just helps us really get the connections and, and get the backing to grow at a bigger space. Um, and it's really exciting for me because we are staying in Alaska, which I think when they approached us was the number one question. I was just like, so we get to stay, right? And, and they were, they totally get it. They were on board. Um, and so we get to continue to help invest in the ecosystem here, grow, you know, startup, startup culture, hire people out of the universities here and um, hopefully make Kodiak, the spaceport on Kodiak, extremely busy with launches. And that to me is like somebody who grew up here as a kid and was looking for a cool thing um, is really, really exciting because it's like, hopefully, you know, people can see what is happening here and what is next and what is possible in Alaska. And that to me is like the most exciting part. So um, it's a huge deal for us. And it's been a, a long time in the making. And for anybody who's ever bootstrapped a company, like it's, it's, it's really nice to know that somebody else believes in what you're doing and, <laughs> and wants to help you get there. Yeah. Just justifies all the hard work, right? Big time. Big time. All right. I'm going to slide over to questions. We have a few, a few that come in through the chat. Uh, this one, I think you and I talked a few days ago about this one. And uh, I'm, I'm interested to hear your answer so everybody can kind of, uh, so I'm just going to read it to you. Uh, okay. Mr. Gleason, this one's from you. It said, NASA recently did its second hot fire test of the SLS-4 RS-25 rockets. Uh, they ran the test for eight minutes and it was incredible to watch. Uh, can you speak about the complexity of this kind of test and also elaborate on what 1.6 million pounds of thrust feels like and how they kept the rocket on the ground? Yeah, um, I, I would. I can speak to this a little bit. So this is an incredibly complex task. Um, you're, you're filling a, a stage. So you're, you're taking the first stage of the rocket, you're you know, bolting it to the ground and you're ripping the engines at, at, at full thrust or the main engines at full thrust for, for what's called MDC, mission duty cycle, which in this case is, I think they went over mission duty cycle, but they went for a full eight minutes, which is cool. It, they went like 816 or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And um, it's, it's incredibly complex. You have to get everything on board. Um, you're, you're, you're loading inert gases. Um, oftentimes those inert gases are bathed in um, what's called a COPV, a carbon rate pressure vessel inside the liquid oxygen tank so that the gas is really cold and you can get more gas on board. You're, you're getting, you know, you have hundreds, if not thousands of lines of data coming in in real time that are all tracking whether or not you're hitting your gating criteria, running your procedure, um, valves that are operating at negative, you know, 280 at least, um, likely even colder, um, hoping they're not gonna freeze open, freeze shut. It's, it's incredibly complex. That's before you even light the engines, right? That's, that's loading. And that's the part that I was always a part of was working the ground side, making sure that all of those things actually came together, loaded, run the red team if, if there was a problem, get out on the pad, fix a valve. Um, the closest I've come to the start of the test was, Flight, I guess it was for flight six. Flight six of Falcon 9, I think it was in the summer of 2013. I went to the test stand in Texas um, in McGregor and they have the same thing. First stage of Falcon 9, bolted down um, and ran mission duty cycle for 100, like roughly 180 seconds, three minutes. And I stood on one of the test stands outside um, and I could, I could get on Google Earth and see how far away it was. If it felt like I was close before they turned the engines on. And then all, and then all of a sudden, like your chest just feels like it's like caving in. Everything's rattling. You're, I'm up like two stories on the second stage test stand for the engines. Like, so they run all the engines through this test stand and the whole thing's just shaking. And I'm, and I'm, you know, you're holding on to this metal bar and like, it was like hard to breathe by the end of it. Cause it's just such a like sensory overload of salt. Um, and it was really freaking cool to be honest. And then, you know, on launch day for that, for that same vehicle, I was on the, what's called the quantity distance line, the QD line um, in firefighter gear. Um, and the rocket, you know, takes off and, and flies out and, and it's the same thing as it starts to roll. You can really feel all the thrust and it's crazy. I, I think it's like the most overwhelming feeling in the world because it's every sense all at once, you know, it's, it's like vibrating in your feet. It's, it's caving in your chest, your ears, even with ear protection, you know, it's just like so much we're screaming at each other. Like, are you, and everybody's like, I don't know, you know, it was crazy. So I, yeah, really, really cool experience. Yeah. The, uh, when we talked earlier, you were describing this QD line to me and, and the way you described it a little bit differently earlier. So I want to share that, but you basically described it as the theoretical mathematical line where if the rocket 
explodes and it rains shrapnel down on the earth, if you're outside of that line, you're safe. Yeah, supposedly. And what I what yeah, I was like, what I got from that whole whole uh, sentence was theoretically. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've, we've, we've seen these rockets explode on the launch pad and on video and it's it's pretty impressive when you're you know just across a wire let alone standing two miles from it well yeah i mean even hitting like the deck of the barge like when they would come in and land and like one of them i think you can find the youtube video i don't remember exactly what flight it was all of them blend together when you're working yeah. 24 hours a day it's like swoops over and the leg breaks and it tips over on the deck and blows up when I, I was first on the barge after the fires were out, still out at sea, we're like 200 miles out. And the skin of the rocket is like sticking out of all the shipping containers. Well, actually it shredded the shipping containers, but some of the thicker metal structures, it's sticking out of them like porcupine quills. Like it literally just like blew shrapnel out and it was crazy. And so, you know, obviously that's a pretty tight area, but remember that rocket has almost no fuel left because it's coming right. into land. Right. And it's still <laughs> just like absolutely, you know, laid waste to its entire structure. And so, yeah, it's an insane amount of explosive power. Yeah. So we got another question in the in the chat that is, what is? So you may or may not be able to answer this. Answer it as uh, as you feel uh, appropriate. Uh, what is a common myth about SpaceX, and can you debunk it? What is a common myth about? Well, if I have a little more whiskey, I'll I, I'll tell you some really good ones. But. All right. Well, we can keep drinking. I'm up for that. <laughs> I think a common myth about SpaceX, I'll speak personally on this one. I think a okay. common myth I had going into SpaceX was that we knew what we were doing at all times. <laughs> and I think it's really important to know that what we did know was we were going to figure it out. But right. there was a lot of times that we did not necessarily know the path forward. And that's, that's the job. That's why yeah. we're there, right? Yeah. To figure something out and, and, you know, do that challenge. My, my friend, Paul, who I worked with at SpaceX just privately messaged me like, LOL, all caps. And so I think he's in agreement. I'm trying to be really kind Maybe about Maybe you should it. ask him to answer that question. <laughs> no, yeah. And so I think it's one of those things where like, we didn't know, I, I mean, dude, I was fresh out of grad school. I didn't know what the hell I was doing, right? Like I was, a, I was a Bush pilot with a master's degree, but like, I was real keen to figure it out. And actually yeah. Paul was somebody who I could lean on a lot of times. Like, hey, I'm gonna design this like this. Is this right? And he's like, look, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to save you some embarrassment. <laughs> and so anyway, I think, yeah, that, that's a big thing. But I think it's important to debunk that because it's easy to like see all the success and all the highly produced videos and all the cool stuff and be like, it's just a different breed of people. Yeah. But it's not, right? Like we're all, we're all the same people. It's a lot more exciting when you realize that we're just, we're just iterating and trying to figure it out because that means that anybody can do it and you can, you can jump in and, and get your head wrapped around it and chew on a hard problem. Yeah, that's a perfect segue. I kind of uh, put a question off to the side, hoped we'd had enough time to get to it. But so I'm hoping uh, Jenny, Jenny is on. I don't know if you prepped her or not. Um, I didn't. Jenny, you don't have to talk if you don't want to, but at least keep him honest. So my question is, so I grew up in a hardware store. Um, every problem, you know, plumbing, hardware, you know, chainsaws, everything you would imagine in a hardware store. So every solution to every problem was a hardware solution. You know, you, if it could be solved with a hammer and a pipe wrench, you probably could figure it out. So given the fact that you've spent all this time as a mechanical engineer building rockets and building all of this stuff, um, how, do you actually solve all of your problems at home the same way? Man, so <laughs> that's a tough can, one. I mean, yeah. Can I, can, can I interrupt Ben for one second while you think about it? Yeah, hit me. Um, it is, I was going to send out a, a survey for everyone, kind of helps us gain some metrics and whatnot about these talks and whatnot. Also, DJ wanted a, a little heads up, um, you know, kind of a five minute morning. Sorry to interrupt your guys' flow, no, but going to shoot that out. Um, if you guys can fill that out, it really helps us. All right. Sorry. Go, Ben. Oh, that's cool. That, that gave me time to, to panic, think of an answer. I think, so here's the, so Jenny's on the chat. She waved and says hi. So she, I'm sure would love to come off mute and correct me here. What I would say is this, Jenny owns two businesses of her own. And so like, you're in a household of like type A entrepreneurs. <laughs> and so I think what's great is, is that if I'm having a bad time and I'm spiraling about something, she'll pull me out and vice versa. But man, I think there are times when I'm overly 
analytical, like it's hard to flip the switch, you know, right. like you spend all day. Like I tell my junior engineers, like my job is to eat garbage, like all day long. It's just, I'm a bad news machine. Tell me what's broken. Let's figure out how we're going to fix it. And so then when you're on the short drive home, it's hard to flip that switch off. So then when you have a challenge at home of like, Hey, we got to figure this out or how are we going to do this? Yeah. I, I do think I actually get a little bit like, Oh yeah, great. We're going to do blah, blah, blah. We're going to blah, blah. She's like, Hey man, just chill. Yeah. <laughs> it's gonna, well, it's gonna, I, I won't tell you what she typed in. Well, you probably can read the chat. She was very complimentary. So uh, she's very, uh, she's way too yeah. nice today. The other, the other thing I was going to notice, if you notice Jenny's last name, she definitely has a space related last name. So yeah. Yeah. She, she's from NOLA. So she'd say she has a jazz related last name. Oh, okay. Okay. Very yeah. good. Very good. Um, I'm, we have a few minutes, we have about 10 minutes. Uh, we have a little bit of probably two minutes of kind of uh, logistical stuff at the end, but does anybody else have any questions? Uh, you don't need to type them into the chat. Just unmute yourself and ask the question and uh, let's, you know, let's at least fill the full hour and make sure we uh, really, really make uh, Ben earn his whiskey. Thanks, man. I've got a follow up to my original question, DJ, if nobody else does, but I don't want to hog the stage. Hey, go for it. Um, well, okay. So back to that test fire. There was a just a shit ton of water flowing through there. Yeah. Like, like, it, do they do that during the live launch, or were they just trying to keep the temps down because you know they didn't have any space between the rockets and the ground? And how much water was actually flowing through that system? I don't know exactly, but I'll 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 tell you what I do know. So, first of all, one of my first jobs at SpaceX was building like acoustic water systems. So that water is doing two things. It's, it's keeping things extremely cool, especially like in a test condition where you're strapped to the ground. Um, you have to have a lot of water and they'll, and that's more than you would probably use for a launch. Okay. Um, on the pad, it's also acoustic. So as the vehicle goes away, if you can imagine like a flat concrete area mm -hmm. that becomes essentially a, a reflector and mm -hmm. can, and it can damage payloads, damage vehicles and flight. It's really, really interesting. And so um, I think, if I remember correctly, I was part of the team that took over LC-39A, which is the old space shuttle pad, the old Apollo pad for SpaceX in January of 2014. And the water system there was capable of 900,000 gallons per minute. Um, and that was for per minute? gallons per minute, 900. Yeah, so close to a million gallons every minute of water. Now, they don't have a million gallons of water, right? That's a flow rate. But that's how much you could put out rate-wise. So it could do it for, you know, 20 seconds of fury or something, right? As the vehicle lights up and gets off the pad. So it, it, is, it is for both. It is for acoustic mitigation and, and thermal mitigation. And I have seen some insane stuff on pads. You know, you try to put also what's called ablative. It's, it's like a ceramic coating on, on a lot of different stuff, dope it up. Um, and then it can burn away. And that burns away instead of your metal structure. But man, after like flight six, especially, we found twisted burn metal in the strangest locations, you know, and you just don't know every time the dynamics are a little different. When the rocket takes off that first 10 feet off the pad, it's just burning <laughs> the pad, right? And so depending on what direction the wind is, the engines have to gimbal to keep the rocket straight. So it might just like turn and like burn out this whole, you know, like the transporter erector and stuff. And so it's really important to get off the pad fast. And, and we've seen some insane damage and it's a little bit different every time. SpaceX has gotten very smart through iteration on how to protect against thermal, thermal issues. Cool, thanks. Good. Yeah, it's awesome. Hey, real, real quick, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put you on the spot again. So if I, if I remember right, your, uh, your, 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 your current friend, ex coworker, was his name Paul? Mm -hmm. right. Hey, Paul, is there any question that you would wanna ask Ben that we should know about him that we would not know to ask? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we yeah. can. I guess, why did he keep coming back? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a self-loathing nihilist, Paul. <laughs> no, man, it's, it's too much fun. Why do you keep coming back? You've been out longer than I have. Yeah, same reason. Yep, yep, that's it. It's, it dude, the thing I always say, and like, again, Paul was a, 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 has been a good friend and a mentor on not making too many stupid mistakes um, too early. And the thing I always say is like, well, holy cow, where else? Where are they going to let a 25 year old do this? You know what I mean? Like, holy smokes, the things we got to, to help with and the things we get to work on are, are so, so cool. And it's really fun, fun to be a part of. Um, and you got to take a step back and, you know, really think about it sometimes. So I think that's what keeps me coming back. And, and there's always a new problem, a new adventure. And I, I tried, Paul knows this, I tried to quit a bunch of times. And it's just like, man, 
it's it's just I I like it. I think I'm pretty good at it. And and the proms are it's always interesting. It's always fun. Yeah. So I don't nobody's putting out any other questions in the in the chat. I've got a few more. Just we might as well consume the whole time. So I, 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 there's just so many interesting questions to ask you. But can you give us just an idea? I mean, we see a lot in the news about private private rocket companies putting things in orbit and you know sending things to space. But what are the what are the types of things that people want to send to space? And I'm sure they're not sending cats and dogs and car. Well, I guess somebody has some cars, so I'll take that one back. But you know, what what are we sending to space that's that's you know that's so exciting? Yeah, great question. So generally it is some form of um, imaging or communications, usually, or it's a science package, but the science packages are usually some form of of imaging that may be beyond visual, right? You know, it could be like um, hyperspectral or multispectral or different things, but generally we're doing science on the planet or we're communicating with the planet. Um, for, on bigger rockets, you know, they're putting things into deep space. We're sending, I mean, send a freaking helicopter to Mars. That's awesome. You know, like that's, that's a whole different thing. But when you look at this like quick access to space, people are trying to build constellations. And they want those constellations to communicate with each other via mesh and then radio back to earth. And um, a lot of these small launches would do reseeding of that constellation um, or putting other science up for like the, the moon or, or whatever. So that's, that's the bulk of it, but there's, there's always somebody trying something new. Um, <laughs> I mean, there's, there's imaging satellites up there now that are bringing data down for like hedge funds because they're, they're looking at like futures based on like, Oh, you know, like, look, the, the, there was a drought in X area that's going to affect prices here and here and here. And it's crazy. The, the like second and third order applications that, that occur. Yeah. All right. So we're down to five minutes. I've got two, two, I'm going to two quick questions and then I'll kind of let you. So the first question is Luke has asked, and I'm going to ask you both of them and let you just kind of go. The first question Luke has asked is what do you think about going to Mars? And then after you answer that question, just anything you want us to know about the launch company. You know, how we can connect with you, what we should be looking for, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I'm, I'm super pro going to Mars. I'm very pro going to the moon. Um, we joke, so our director of operations, Rachel, climbed Denali in 2019. It's the tallest mountain in North America here in Alaska. And so I think about this all the time. And it's like, man, if I was going to climb Denali, I would try out my hat and my coat and all my camping gear like, on a little test area, right? I'd go on some test treks, make sure it all kind of came together. So if you talk about going to, the, to Mars, I think having a permanent presence on the moon is, is really cool. Um, and a great way to test things where you're three days from home and not, you know, six months. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I think that's common sense. I, I'm super pro going to Mars. I think it's extremely inspiring. It's really, really fun. Uh, I love the new rovers being there. I'm super excited for when they launch the helicopter. I mean, that, yeah. that's really cool stuff. And yeah. no matter who you are, like, what arena you work in, like that pumps you up. You know, it, it gets you excited about what can be possible. Um, I hope you call her the Denali Lama now. That's funny. I do not. I call her Rachel. Um, and Thanks, Rick. <laughs> I think, uh, I think dream project for our company is we want, we are working to make automated launch on earth. And then we want to be, you know, if you are doing things from Mars and the moon, you've got to get stuff back regularly. We want to figure out how to automate launch so well here that we can work on projects there. And that's really a, a huge dream for us is to work on, on projects that are on other planetary bodies. I think that'd just be a really, really neat thing. Yeah. Um, and I guess wrapping up, I mean, I don't really do social media that much. Y'all can reach me on LinkedIn. I am unfortunately on Twitter all the time. I'm at North Road Ben. I can throw that in the chat. Um, and the launch company is at launch underscore company. And man, um, yeah, really appreciate all the time and all the chat and great questions. And would love to chat with anybody that, that wants to connect. Yeah, this was amazing. I really, really appreciate you taking the time to, to chat with us and everybody else kind of get to, I, I've been the fortunate one to get to hear these stories over the years and, you know, and got to sit down and drink, drink some whiskey with you and really get deep into the weeds and it's been fun. And so getting the opportunity to have you, you know, talk about this stuff and with everybody else has been really exciting. So um, I do want to take one minute before we kind of end this is next, next month on April 26th, the same time, four to five, um, you'll find a theme here. Uh, we'll actually be doing our session two of the Tech Life Live series. It will be with a, with a company out of Louisville called Roth River. 
And uh, once again, stealing from their website, they are building IoT devices and software to modernize the bourbon industry. So they've actually created a, you've heard of CRM software. Uh, they're call, call, uh, they have created BRM software, so bourbon, uh, you know, related. Uh, they're really, really smart guys. The really interesting part is they're talking about how to, how to leverage IoT devices, how to leverage kind of the, the physical aspects of devices in the bourbon industry. So it should be a really, really interesting conversation. So um, that's it. I mean, we're at 458. This probably couldn't have been much better timing. Um, ben, I can't thank you enough. This was amazing. Sure. Um, I promise you I'll make it to Alaska soon and we will drink some whiskey and fish a little bit. I but, so. um, maybe not in that order, but we'll see how that goes. But um, <laughs> if anybody has one, you know, last last thoughts or if everyone wants to give them a thumbs up or an applause or whatever, but this was amazing. I had a great time. Thank you so much for having me, DJ. This was great. It's always fun yeah. to chat with you, man. Looking Absolutely. forward to the next time. It's really, really good. So, all right, we're at time. I appreciate it. We'll talk to you soon and uh, we'll see everybody next month. Thanks, DJ. Best of luck, Ben. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, best of luck, man. Thanks, everybody. Cool. Be safe out there. See y'all. See you, Ben. I'll see everybody.